Welcome everybody um, to Touchdown in Strochdale. Um, my name is Derek Horton. I'm one of the two curators of, of the exhibition at all the uh, Rochdale Art Gallery in the 1980s. Alice, Alice Carrera, Dr. Alice Carrera, over here is my co curator. Um, I don't think we need too much of an introduction about the exhibition itself. I think many people in the room have seen it. Um, and anyone who's watching this later, um, by definition, will know something about it because they'll already be on the website in order to be able to see it. So I won't, I won't waste time talking too much about the exhibition. Um, but talking of recording, I should just say, there will be a Q&A afterwards <laughs> and we are recording, so just in case anyone doesn't wish to be recorded, please indicate that at the time. Um, so this is the first in a series of, of in-conversation talks that we've been running alongside the exhibition. Um, Alice will introduce our two guests today very shortly. Um, three of the events are online and three, like this, are live in the gallery, but all six will be recorded so they will be available from, from whatever point they reach the website, I'm not sure when that will be, but, but, so they won't be available on the website. So, um, and we've tried to, to, in the talks, cover different aspects of of the exhibition themes. Um, so this one we'll find out about very shortly. Uh, and the next one is, is very soon actually. The next one's on Wednesday the 8th of February, next Wednesday. Um, and that's Malcolm Glover, who was a photographer in residence here, and Pony of Caesar talking about documentary photographic practices. Um, then on the 8th of March, and um, that's online, will be Bev by the way, who is an assistant curator here from the early 1980s, together with Brian Biggs from um, Blue Coat Liverpool, talking about networks of curating in the north of England. Um, and then Keith Piper and Pete Clark, two artists who are both represented in the show, We'll be talking about a particular exhibition called Depicting History for Today that they were both part of, and we'll use that as a starting point for talking about depicting history today, lowercase, um, in terms of the way that's, that's still relevant. And then on the 5th of April, Harold Uffay and Michelle Williams Gamaka, who are both younger contemporary artists who are in the exhibition will be talking about portraiture, self-portraiture and representation of itself. <coughs> and then the final one on Saturday the 22nd of April is Sarah Jo Ford, who's a younger artist who's been commissioned especially to make work, new work for this show, and Veronica Slater, who's a painter whose his work is in the show. Um, and they're talking about genealogies of queer art and modernism and the relationship of, of, of modernism to queer identifying practitioners. So that's the programme we have coming up. Um, but for now, I'm going to hand over to, to Alice to introduce today's talk and today's special guests. So I'm going to join the audience now and enjoy it from out there. Um, thanks, Derek. Um, so today uh, I'm delighted to welcome uh, Professor Sarah Edge and Leslie Sanderson, um, who will be talking about uh, feminism and feminist exhibitions at Rochdale Art Gallery. Um, the exhibition, A Tour or the Rochdale Art Gallery in the 1980s, examines the history of what was happening here during that decade. And um, under the leadership of Jill Morgan, 
the um, exhibition's officer. Jill took a particularly feminist approach to her exhibition making. And um, throughout um, the 1980s, there were some significant exhibitions of feminist artists here, um, notably um, Pandora's Box in 1984, and along the lines of resistance in 1989, which Sarah co-curated with Claire Slattery from um, the Cooper Gallery in Barnsley, and which um, Leslie uh, exhibited in. So we will be talking about um, the history of that exhibition, how that exhibition came about, and Leslie's participation in it. But we will also be thinking more broadly about how um, a gallery like Rochdale um, supported and facilitated the careers of young women artists. So I'll just press play on this slideshow. Um, skip forward. Um, the slides will show work by Sarah and Leslie, and I should say that Sarah's work is also in the exhibition. Um, and we'll just have a conversation. There'll be things um, sh on the screen as we as we talk. Uh, but to start off with, um, Leslie Sanderson's an artist, um, and with Neil Comroy, she works in collaboration as Comroy Sanderson. Um, her solo work will be in the forthcoming exhibition, Women in Revolt at Tate Britain, later this year. And Professor Sarah Edge is an artist and publisher based in Belfast. She's also a recently qualified art psychotherapist, and as I've intimated, during the 1980s, Sarah was an assistant exhibitions officer here at Rochdale Art Gallery and also a practicing performance artist. So, um, to start off with, um, I wondered if Sarah and Leslie, you could both just give an introduction to where you were studying during the mid, early mid 1980s, what type of work you were making. Um, and just to position, give us a sense of where you were at in um, the mid 80s uh, and what you were doing. And Sarah, do you want to start? Uh, yeah, so I did a fine art degree in Portsmouth, um, which was absolutely great space, very radical artists there. Um, and so I was introduced to feminism there by Kate Walker. Um, and she introduced me to the publication Feminist Art News. I have to say, I was really not interested in feminism when I first went to college. And then I got introduced to it by Kate and it completely transformed me, completely changed me. We had amazing visiting artists like Mo Mona Hatoum and Monica Ross. Um, there were other people there, um, Adrian Rifkin. So I also got really introduced into Marxist socialist politics as well. And actually that really came together into what I followed my heart with for the rest of my life, actually, around particularly inequalities around gender um, and class. So that kind of became my passion. Um, I went on and did um, the MA in the Social History of Art with Griselda in Leeds. Um, and I was also taught there by John Tagg, who was a writer in, on photography um, and a Marxist. And again, that really kind of fueled my interest. I wrote my dissertation on the photographs of um, mining women taken in the 1860s. And I then made that into the piece of art, which is upstairs, which is the performance mine or history. Um, and that kind of toured around in, during the, the mid um, 80s and during the minor strike. So it was the minor strike that instigated me to make the piece of work, which was about the whole missing history of women in the mining industry when the miners' strike in the 1980s really became a whole battle around uh, masculinity in the unions and the Tories. And I thought it was really important to reintroduce that whole history that this industry was an industry of women's labour as well. Um, 
Prior to getting the job in as assistant curator, um, we had this this group. I'll just quickly show you. This is we we set up this. Oh, great okay. Oh, great. <laughs> Whether you'd think I was really organised, but I'm not. So that so. The, the um, Rochdale Performance Collective. So before I actually got the job, I was working with lots of people <coughs> around Rochdale. Rochdale was a fantastic place. It was so much amazing stuff going on. Um, and the Rochdale Performance Collective and um, some of the people that I'd met at college, we brought in to do performances. So Mona Hatoum and Monica and then Sally Dawson, who's my best friend. And we've kind of worked together and she works on feminist art news at the time. But, you know, it was a collective of, of artists, people interested in the arts, radical people, all working together. And it was um, a, a really kind of amazing time of bouncing ideas off each other, doing performances. The spaces for the performances were really important. It wasn't just the gallery, but it was out into the community. We organised in the Hacienda in Manchester for performances to go on there. I would have been performing at women's conferences, uh, at um, events raising money for the miners' strike, etc. So it wasn't just about the gallery space. Um, and so I had all this connection with Rochdale before I got the job as assistant exhibitions curator. My particular passion, as I said, really was, uh, was really around um, gender, class and, and disability. So really intersectional, like that was really where my interests were at. Um, and I suppose that's, I continued on with performance art once I became a curator. So I did other performances, but... In 1987, I had my first child and I went on a job share in Rochdale. So then I worked three days a week. So in the other two days, I was doing loads of curating and performing and writing. And along the lines of resistance came out of that, which was kind of independent exhibition curation. So I think that's probably enough. Great, thank you. <laughs> Lizzie, do you want to say um, Well, I... I came to Sheffield, um, I went to Sheffield in 1981 to do a degree in painting and printmaking. Um, the first two years I was really floundering, what does a young artist make work about? Um, I really didn't know what to make work about. Um, and I, I really recall one lecturer, a lovely man called Ted Beavers, a printmaking lecturer, told me, um, if you're, you're Malaysian, you're from Malaysia, I would never know that your work comes from that cultural background. Why don't you try and address that in some way? So I had that in the back of my head. Um, and in the last year of um, my degree, I was taught by Rosemary Betterton, mm -hmm. um, a feminist um, writer and academic. Um, and Rosemary, Rosemary's course was on feminism and she introduced us to a lot of feminist artists and through her teaching I was introduced to people that sort of helped me shape a sense of where I might place myself. So I was really interested in the work of Kathy Colwitz. Um, I loved I loved the graphic quality, the graphic ability of Kathy Colwitz, the way that she could uh, draw and make prints that which, is, which were incredibly tender but also very strong. And I'm, I'm particularly drawn to one of those prints of a mother, grasp, a very strong woman grasping um, her child as she died, as, as the child died. And I thought that that was just an amazing image. And another artist that um, Rosemary introduced us to was Cindy Sherman. Um, I'd never seen work like this before. Um, I was really interested that this was an artist who did self-portraits and yet she was always absent from the, those self-portraits. So I was interested in how she played with femininity. Um, I was really interested in how meticulously um, constructed they were. Um, and I was just really seduced with them. And then the, the, the most important um, um, artist that she introduced us to was you know, like a lot of sorry, like a lot of uh, artists at the time were really interested uh, interested in Frida Kahlo. Um, 
she hadn't been known to many people in the country at that point, but she seemed really, really so, so central to, I think, a lot of developments within um, feminist art in this country because all of a sudden people such as myself could find a way into how to make images potentially about themselves. So what I loved about Frida Kahlo's work was that she was, uh, the work was very personal, but it was also political. So that whole sense of the personal and political, which was so much part of, of feminism at that point, I could see a way in, but also because of the Mexican and dual heritage that she explored within her work. And also I just loved the way that the paintings were constructed. So sort of armed with those three um, artists and also I was interested in, I suppose I became interested in feminism and through Rosemary's teaching, it just totally changed my life. The fact that it just, it threw, it made, just everything thrown up in the air and it made me question everything about how um, art history had been constructed in the past, how women's images were, were constructed and I was just um, I was just astonished really and I was very interested in Laura Mulvey, um, Visual Pleasure and Narrative Cinema, that article where she writes in a quote, in a world ordered by sexual imbalance Pleasure in looking has been split between active male and passive female. And I thought that that was just, it seems so obvious now, but to me, to a young person, learning to unpick the, um, you know, the, the, the way images are made, that was just really astonishing. So out of that, I started to think about how to make work about who I was, to, because Although I was interested in feminism, I, I couldn't find a home within it. So I tried to sort of turn that into looking at representing myself, representing someone of my sort of cultural background. And so out of that, I started making self-portraits, looking at um, my physiognomy and my face. Um, and there's, um, so I, I did some self-portraits. Maybe, that's, <laughs> maybe I'll just stop there. Yeah, no, that's great. Thank you. I think that ties in with so beautifully with what was going on here at Rochdale and the way that Jill was engaging with the historic collection in particular. Um, when you were talking about visual pleasure, it reminded me of the painting that's in the show of um, the. It's called the Young Rower, and it's a painting of a woman who is getting changed in order to go and undertake the sporting activity of rowing. But it is um, a very, voyeur, to my mind, a very voyeuristic, titillating painting in many ways. And Jill um, took that painting from the collection and exhibited it, but reframed it exactly through that feminist lens and through perhaps, I don't know how, familiar Jill was with Laura Mulvey at that time, but it seems to me that there are definite synergies between just rethinking what types of images of women are we presented with on a daily basis and how can we challenge them and rethink them mm -hmm. and actually resist them as well. Mm -hmm. um, so, Sarah, when we left off, you were just beginning to talk about your work as an independent curator. And I've mentioned that the exhibition along the lines of resistance is a really fem um, important moment, I think, in the history of feminist exhibitions in the UK. Um, and it hasn't received the attention that it deserves by any stretch of the imagination. So um, it was a, a touring exhibition. It started off at the Cooper Gallery in Barnsley and then traveled to Rochdale. And it was a collabor collaborative effort, um, uh, curatorially, between you, um, uh, Claire Slattery and Shutifa Biswas. And I wondered if you could say a bit about how that exhibition, how the three of you came together, how that exhibition came together, and then um, I know that it was an open submission show. So I wondered then, Leslie, if you could speak to um, why you decided to take the plunge and submit your work? Should, 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 so, 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 so
Rochdale was Rochdale during the years that I was working here was a really interesting space because um, different women ki kind of came in and came out in different working relationships and um, Claire Slattery uh, worked with me on the mine or history the, the historical exhibition which went with the performance um, and she had also worked as a researcher on Victorian women artists with Deborah Cherry and she had also done the MA in the Social History of Art. So I think I actually met her from the MA in the Social History of Art. Um, and Shutapur, I, I had met originally, she did her fine, this is quite difficult to remember all this, <laughs> but she did, she was doing a degree in fine art in Leeds. Mm. And one of the things that me and Jill used to do is we would we used to visit the end of year shows and go and look and see whether there was some interesting artists there whose work we might pick for exhibitions. And I think that's a really important thing that for me and Jill and the other women that worked in the gallery, it was always about the work. It didn't matter what age you were, how established you were, it was about the work and it was about the message of the work in terms of what that work was engaging in. So we went around the shows and my memory is, is that um, I, I remember going into a studio and seeing Shutapur's work with... Oh, oh, uh, uh, Housewives of Stairs. Yes, and going, oh my God, and... <laughs> That was it, you know, like, that was it, right, you know, let's do something with this woman. And, and I met Shutapa and we kept up a friendship and Shutapa then exhibited in one of the issue of painting. So we, t we would, you know, so the, the shows would be a mixture of quite well-established artists with maybe somebody who had only just graduated. And I think that is, was really radical actually, because that's not the way that things were done before and it's not the way things are done now, you know. Um, so when, when I went uh, on to, that made me, left me two days to do other things. And the, th the three of us were really, very interested in what is now called intersectionality, but is then wasn't, you know, it just was, oh, this is so interesting, you know, these differences, but uh, debates around women and experience. And we decided that we wanted to make a show about it. So um, Claire at this stage had started as the curator in Barnsley in the Cooper Gallery. So she took, she took the lead and the money, the way things work then is you would apply for money from the Arts Council or each gallery would have a budget, you would make a show and you might tour that show and the other galleries would give you some money towards the tour which would then give you enough to actually put the show on. So the three of us worked together with the Cooper Gallery and in the Cooper Gallery as the first space and then it, it toured. Um, and it was the process of selection was there was an open call so we advertised in artist newsletter and magazines and feminist art we advertised for, for people to submit but there were, was also invited submissions so artists that we each one of us particularly liked um, from past work we, we uh, invited them to apply um, and, and Leslie actually was, was one of the people I invited to apply and I really, had to, I really had to do some kind of investigating to remember that process because I had actually, I, I used to also write for City Life as their arts reviewer and Bev, by the way, who had worked in Rochdale, moved to the corner house and Bev did a series of three exhibitions with the, with the three City Life arts reviewers. And I did one which was Political Life, which was in, eight, 19, in 85. And I had seen Leslie's work in her end of degree show and I selected it for the Political Life. So I had actually completely forgotten that until I went into my hoard of stuff which I never throw away and found all this information, which 
it kind of really clarified for me actually that whole process about searching, finding people, you know, really be engaging with the work and the, and the different galleries, not just Rochdale actually, but a whole network of galleries really supporting those artists and saying, you know, your work's fantastic, let's get it out there. So, you know, that's, that's kind of the history of the, ah. the actual show. Okay, well, I hadn't really realised that we actually met each other because <laughs> you talked to me when you came, came around to see the degree shows. So it's really interesting that you've sort of prompted me to, rem to remember that. <laughs> and one of the, the pieces that was shown in um, along the lines of resistance was a, a piece of work that I made in that um, ex uh, in that end of year degree show exhibition, which was called uh, "Self Portrait as a Chinky," yeah. where it's a it's a portrait um, that's so big, um, it's um, it's bigger than life size, and on my face. Um, is painted um, a British movement sign, so a circle with a cross, white white circle with, um, with a cross in the centre, and I'm pulling my eyelids up as in, as as is um, in the racist abuse of people calling people chinkies. So that was one of the pieces that um, I think was shown in City Life, yeah. And then you then asked for that to be shown in Along the Lines of Resistance, and and alongside that. Along the lines of resistance, I showed um, the piece that's upstairs, which is called Time for a Change. Mm. Uh, and the thing, I did that after I'd left um, Polytechnic. Mm. Um, and the, the thinking I, I did in terms of how I came about with making that piece of work was uh, it started with the image of um, the Gerald Kelly um, reproduction of uh, the Burmese princess, which was. A, pr a reproduction that was very um, prevalent in a lot of people's homes in, in the 60s. And my, my, my family had it, and we, it was in our home in Malaysia. Um, and it was an image which I just thought was absolutely beautiful. I, I thought this was a beautiful woman, and I sort of aspired to be like her. And then with, with, um, with my feminist um, sort of teachings, I... I started to try and unpick my reading of that image and and realise that this was really really very problematic, you know, because she was she was her body is so coded with a patriarchal uh, perspective in mind. So so I was in the in the piece of work I was really trying to have this dialogue with myself. Why you know so this dialogue between the two, um, you know, between me and and the depiction. But also, I was also thinking of um, a piece of work that Rosemary Batterson had drawn drawn our attention to, Velasquez Rockaby Venus, which um, is in in the National Gallery, um, and I was really interested in in that in in the fact that um, about a hundred years ago, that, um, a, a suffragette had attacked the, the painting um, and hacked it with a meat cleaver about five times. Um, because it was like it was seen as the epitome of, of female beauty, and um, Ma Mary Mary Rock Richardson, I think it is. She was um, known in the in the news at that at that point as Slusher Mary. Um, she said that it it's because of um, she she was really distressed. So therefore, but because of um, Emily Pankhurst had been arrested. And so it was in protest against that, and, and also because she absolutely hated the fact that all these male visitors would go to the, the National Gallery and just stare all day at this, this image. So um, I wanted to sort of do a piece of work whereby I sort of engaged with the, with the female nude in some way, but in such a way as not for it to be um, read as a patriarchal depiction of a female. So hence, you know, I, 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 I presented myself naked um, in front of the, the portrait. Um, so that's sort of the, the thinking behind that image that then was shown here and, and elsewhere. And what's really nice is that then that, that, that image has been sort of, been, in the past has been picked up and written about and sort of, um, you know, gone in, in some way being historicised. Brilliant. Well, it's quite Thank fitting that we have um, 
at the time of the exhibition, when it was at the Cooper Gallery, the Feminist Art um, News ran an interview <coughs> with Sarah and the curators, um, with Jane Beckett, the art historian, and just on screen is the page from the exhibition catalogue. And Sarah, in, the, in your discussion with Jane, in that interview in Feminist Art News, you talk about how important Leslie's painting was for you in reevaluating um, the depiction of naked or nude women in art. And so I wondered if you could say something about that. Leslie sort of touched on it a bit with the history of the Rugby Venus, but. Um, yeah, I think. I think it's an example, I suppose, of how um, how reading and research uh, allows you to evolve um, your ideas about things. And and I suppose my ideas as a feminist, you know. So I think um, early on in my feminism, I would have kind of felt, I don't think women can use the naked body. Um, and then, the more I read, to be honest, as you say, Laura Mulvey, and the more I, became, I suppose, in, um, educated myself about how representations work mm -hmm. and the complexities of representations and how representations of women and representations in terms of race, how if you put those two things together, you can't apply the same kind of lens of looking at things that I might have had before. And I just, um, so th there was quite a lot of women's performance work going on at the time that I did find very problematic. Mm. I'm not gonna say any names, but. You know, I, you know, I was quite uncomfortable with. And then when I saw that th that piece of work by Leslie, I just felt okay. This is this is a piece of work where that dual representation about um, uh, Orientalism or exoticism and everything. This is coming into this picture, and the, the naked female body is not the same mm -hmm. in that context. And the, the, the gaze in it was a gaze that refuted that ability to be able to look at the female body. And, you know, I can, honestly, I can kind of look back now and almost dissect my brain and say, what were you think, why, at the time, honestly, I probably was like, oh, wow, this is great. I just love this. Not 100% sure why, you know, and, and I think feminism is always a learning process, always. And, you know, how I think now and how I think sort of back in when I was in college in the 1980s, not exactly the same. The central core of wanting to change relationships of power mm -hmm. is there, but I needed to learn how to do that. You know, it's not something that I'm just going to be born with or, you know, is, is there. So I hope that answers the yes. question. <laughs> um, well, I suppose to add to that, um, I suppose the gaze was central to that piece of work and it's been central to all the work I did in the 80s. So I'm always looking back at the viewer, um, challenging the look, um, tr trying to challenge the power relationship that's been set up between the artist and and who's being viewed. So I'm always trying to do that. But also in, in the work, um, you know, I I cut my hair so that there, there wasn't that, um, you know, the long sort of feminine sort of docile mm -hmm. um, depiction. Um, <clears throat> and I suppose I was naked as, as well to take away the the cultural references, so that um, you're just sort of you're stripping something back, um, stripping back also so that it is, becomes a bit more timeless. Um, the colours were meant to be more um, 
although quite sort of pastely, they were sort of meant to be more assertive and vibrant. So there, there was a, I was trying to shift everything so that there was an assertiveness, while still trying to, to depict it in a way that was, um, you know, still trying to sort of make it a beautiful image, rather, you know, rather than an ugly image, because in keeping with, with the original, which I, which I still think is really, really rather beautiful. So it, it's, it's trying to have that dialogue, which I understood was problematic, mm -hmm. uh, but not, you know, just, just that really. So, but I mean, all this work was very much about um, that power dynamic, mm -hmm. trying to bring in a different racial uh, perspective, because mm -hmm. I'd found within feminism that I didn't feel at home within feminism because that, um, that you know, I was showing within the black art movement, um, which was seen as a political rather than, rather than an ethnic grouping of people. Mm -hmm. So I felt very much at home within that and, and also within feminism, but particularly within along the lines of resistance because there was people from different cultural backgrounds included, which it just hadn't happened before. So, um, so that was why that exhibition I think is so important um, because it really was one of the first mm -hmm. times that had ever happened in this country. So, so that's great. <laughs> yeah, no, absolutely. I, I, um, I absolutely agree that retrospectively we can look at a lot of the lines of resistance and the artists who were included in that show, and I'm looking at the list, mm -hmm. Simone Alexander, Sonia Boyce, Shaila Kamari Berman, Sally Dawson, Zena Dimitriou, Nina Edge, Catherine Ensor, Trisha Ferguson, Rachel Field, Leslie Hakan Derek, Mona Hatou, Lavona Himid, Rosamond Kels Kinsey Miller, uh, Monica Ross, Leslie Sanderson, Veronica Slater, Marlene Smith, Maud Sorter, and Tally Time, Lois Williams. That's a remarkable Twenty list of artists, mm -hmm. yeah. um, all of whom are making just incredibly powerful work. Mm -hmm. But as you say, the, the diversity, I suppose in today's language, of the artists who are included in that really makes a stark contrast to the feminist mm -hmm. exhibitions that were taking place in the early 80s mm -hmm. that were largely white and quite often middle class. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and I think it's notable that actually um, Lois Williams is the only artist in along the lines of resistance who also showed in Pandora's box, which was the um, other sort of significant feminist show, at, mm. group show at um, at Rochdale. So there's something about that. But Sarah, in the article, you also mentioned that something about. And that, uh, so I should also say that mo most of those artists in the show were younger, who had mm -hmm. come through art college in the 1980s. And in the article, you referenced the fact that although this was a, an open call exhibition, um, that older generation of artists didn't apply. Mm -hmm. And I wonder if you could reflect on maybe why that was. Or did you have any inkling at the time? Um. Oh my god. <laughs> <laughs> if not, because I, this, my memory is, is that there actually wasn't much um, conversation between that generation Artists. of women artists and. Um, I think you know this 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 generation. I don't I don't recall anything in the gallery when I was working where there was that conversation. Mm -hmm. And I mean, um, I think all of this work, every participant in it was were was engaging with contemporary theory mm -hmm. on some level or other which which pushed their work into a much more critical space mm -hmm. um, and that wasn't necessarily going on so I you know I just don't think there was big conversation happening that's just 
you know, I hadn't really thought about it. And I, I and when I read that, I kind of think, oh my God, you know, in a way we were so flippant. Do you know, like all these really big famous artists, and we were like, oh, well, they didn't bother us, and we didn't bother them. And I was kind of like, oh, we we're so flippant. But when I kind of think back on it now, you know, it's just, I don't think the conversation was happening. And that's, if the conversation was what was going on, I think, which is very interesting, your kind of experience of talking about your work. And my experience, and probably other women in, in the room, the conversation was happening between feminist theory and the, and the artists mm -hmm. making. So re Laura, reading Laura Mulvey, uh, Rosemary Better, you know, like mm -hmm. it was that engagement, I think, with those texts mm -hmm. rather than an engagement with those artists. Right. I think what was really interesting also that is that a lot of those artists were young, like you said, but there are, a lot of them are also out living outside of the capital. Mm -hmm. so, and I think, really that, I think there's no, no coincidence mm -hmm. that there's, a, there's been a lot of political work, feminist work, that came out of the North. Mm -hmm. And I think that, I can't state that enough, I think, because when I think back of my own career, I've hardly ever been selected by, any, by anybody, uh, curator-wise, from the South. It's, it's tended to be from the north that I've been um, selected for. So Sarah, Beth, by the way, um, might too be, um, mm -hmm. look, um, Brian Big, you know, mm -hmm. so it's, they've all been sort of northern curators. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of those artists, I think, mm -hmm. were not London based, mm -hmm. whereas maybe they might have gravitated towards London later. I think that there was something going on within the North that I think was really interesting at the time. And potentially it's because of what was happening politically, which was, which was all happening outside of London mm -hmm. as well. Mm -hmm. So I just, just thought I'd throw that yeah, in. I think, that's, it. I think yeah, that's absolutely true. Absolutely, you know, it wasn't happening in the centre and it, it, it happened in the North and there were so many there was Project UK, there was the Midland Group, there was all sorts of stuff going on in the, in the North. And I, the two commissions that I got for making my performances were from Project UK, you know, in before 1987. And they, in the North, there seemed to be this whole network and people who weren't just select, but were actually giving you a bit of money so that you could make some of this work. And I think that's really that's a really important point. And the other point is that um, the curators were often ex artists or practicing artists, whereas I think I think again that's very significant. You know, so you sort of a, uh, you know, the, the, there's a whole host of, of mm -hmm. curators who had come through being practicing artists. Mm -hmm. um, so quite different to how curators are now sort of schooled within curatorial studies rather than mm -hmm. um, going through the fine art process themselves. Mm -hmm. yeah. So we're coming at the process of exhibition making in a very different way. Yeah, yeah. being involved themselves potentially, yeah. and have their own interests. Yeah. And I think then what you're saying about the North and the Northern networks will tap in really wonderfully to the conversation that we'll have with um, Beth, by the way, and Brian Biggs in a couple of weeks. Um, and there's something about which, and it also suggests that there's something very special about Rochdale Art Gallery and being in the, this gallery, in this place, mm. facilitating and offering a space for artists to to do something different, to mm. do something a little bit outside of the convention that you might find in a London space or a mm. larger metropolitan space. Mm. Um, we've got a little bit of time for questions. If anyone from the audience would like to contribute, we can raise, open up the discussion a bit further. <coughs> Derek. Well, I'd kind of like to continue what you were just talking about in a way, because the, that whole idea of, of the way in which radical questioning approaches to making art and, and to making exhibitions was happening in the North 
we've, we've brought down, I think, arguably in many ways at the centre of it. Um, but, you know, we mentioned it well, I think, and, and things happening in the north, in and, and in Birmingham too, where I'm from and where I still was at that time. I, would, I just wonder why you, you know. I mean, obviously we've we've got ideas about that. we have been forward some of the ways in which we've got about making this exhibition, but but I wonder what why it was you, that you think it was it was more possible. For artists to engage in political ways here than in the metropolis. I, were, were artists more politicised in the north? I don't know. Um, I think we were. Well, kind of, yeah. 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 I think there was. There was, a, there was work going on in London. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. I should have discussed that. that. But yeah. what there was was a <coughs> collective. There was a printmaking, women print collective. There was, you know, there were small groups of women in Leeds. There was a women in women's yeah. photography centre, feminist arts news, which was national, which took international actually, that took uh, women involved from all over the country. Mm -hmm. You live in London. <laughs> you know, there were women involved of course, from yeah. south and north, mm -hmm. and it wasn't. Um, and so some of the women involved in rock show were also involved in fan. We're also involved in like curating a different way. There was a lot of different stuff going on. You know, it wasn't all in the separate yeah. places. I'm only nervous. <laughs> but I mean, the, the whole idea of networking is important, mm. I think. And you know, when you mentioned some of those other northern curators and perhaps some southern ones, southern based ones mm. too, it, you know, the, the, the network of connections, I think, mm. is really important. And, and the ways in which mm. you know many many shows that were here to to Blue Coat, many shows yeah. that were at, at Sheffield, to to Rochdale, and and those, those mm. kind of connections that are all about people in the end, mm, yeah. and, and 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 you know those personal connections and political connections between people. And we weren't just networking; we were working together on yeah. different projects, yeah. lots and lots of different projects, different types of things, writing stuff. Reviewing each other's stuff, being involved in each other's books, you know, there was lots of different things, teaching in different places, doing random things. So perhaps this is more, this perception of a north south divide is, I don't know, it's, this is speculative. Is that, do you think that could potentially be more about how the history of the 80s has been written? and passed down and that actually one of the reasons for wanting to do this exhibition at all order was actually to expose these histories of what was going on because they haven't been written um, and I was talking to someone last night about if you look at you know survey exhibition survey books about the history of British art and you turn to the 80s you might have Lucian Freud, David Hockney and maybe Tony Cragg and a few others but who are essentially London-based, mm -hmm. more or less. Um, and that is kind of the narrative that is continues to a large extent to be passed down through our history books, at least. I wonder a bit whether it's also to do with municipal galleries. Yeah, and the funds. Yeah, yeah. And the you know, and... Yeah. Um, Definitely. Again, I haven't really thought about it, but now I think, you know, Sheffield, I think the mapping, yep. you know, yeah. that you didn't have that in the South. You didn't have these municipal spaces which employed uh, exhibitions officers mm -hmm. who then had a budget, who then actually, it's almost like feminists managed to get their way in there. You know, yeah. it kind of <laughs> kept well, it's interesting, I think, that, that municipal thing as well, in relation, not just in relation to London, but in relation to big cities. Um, mm -hmm. Because the corner house yeah. was doing things, yeah. but, but there were far more interesting radical things happening in Rochdale than there were in Manchester. Yeah. As I said, yeah. I'm from Birmingham. There were far more interesting and radical things happening in Wolverhampton yeah. than ever happened in Birmingham. So th th there does seem to be something about mm -hmm. the margins of yeah. the periphery yeah. and the, 
the places that people don't think yeah. about being the places where the most interesting things. It was. I mean, the pen, There were really good gallery spaces, and there were spaces in London which weren't the well-established spaces. So the Pentonville was one, and mm. that was great. And there was also, th there were other little sites yeah. where things yeah. were going on, but the big, well-established galleries were not the spaces they did. In, <laughs> there were the kind of three big shows in London in the ICF. You know, yeah. there the were those shows at the beginning. Um, and then things kind of moved out. And, you know, I, ha I really do have to impress as well how radical Rochdale Council was. Yeah. You know, this was not, this was not, you know, some women in an art gallery working against a count that was not. The council was supportive. The museum services, I was, me and Patsy were racking our brains to think of who our boss, and it was someone called Bill Hart. We, we kept, you know, we, and, you know, as Patsy said, he was like a rockabilly, you know, he always, he, he had brute art shape. I think it's recording now, but you know, like if we hadn't have had those people there at the top in the council supporting us, none of this would have happened. Well, one of the very mm -hmm. early things that I found in the archive was, was Rochdale Council's cultural policy. Mm -hmm. And I can't remember which year in the 80s it was. But I mean, for anyone who was, familiar with those times, it was more radical than I've ever read Absolutely. anything that came out of the GLC, for instance. Absolutely. It was more radical than that. Yeah. And, you know, it is extraordinary that, that you know, Rochdale had yeah. a, 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 a Labour council that was as culturally, not, not just about being on the left in that way, but, but being on the left with a commitment to culture. Um, mm -hmm. And how culture and <coughs> politics related. I mean, that, that is can't be understated. Mm -hmm. And and the way in which that changed politically in in the council makeup of Russia mm -hmm. is undoubtedly part of the story of mm -hmm. how mm -hmm. some of the things that that, that we that happened that we're all celebrating ceased to happen in the nineties. And I think that this thing about, I don't know what happened to the 80s, right? You know, I moved on and I moved into a different career. I, you know, I became a lecturer more uh, and I moved in that direction. And then I would, I used to think, why is nobody interested? I, think, I honestly, I was I like, is this like invisible? <laughs> yeah, freeze happened, I think. So this exhibition... Um, Women in Revolt, they, they've got their, their, their end point as the freeze exhibition. Mm -hmm. So that's when everything to, they, in, in their that, sorry, so see, that The freeze that exhibition right? was the exhibition curated by Damien Hurst, yeah. which was the, the, I don't know, the entry point of the YBAs, the Young British Artists, into the 90s. And commercialism. And the commercialisation yeah. of yeah. the 90s. So that's what happened. Yeah. That yeah. Yeah. killed everything off. Yeah, but why? I, I agree, and I absolutely saw it happening. I, I saw it happening to the end of my time working in Russia. I saw that happening, this complete commercialisation, even of radical art, like, mm -hmm. you know, this commercialisation. But what really interests me is how did the history disappear? Because feminist, uh, feminist art news, it, women's artists, like, it just all disappeared, you know. And, uh, and I'm so... Suddenly everybody became interested a few years ago, well, maybe five years, and I'm like, oh, I'm so glad, you know, because actually what happened in the 80s in the arts is just... There's so much to learn from it, and it was so fantastic. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, everybody, everyone who was working in all those different areas. And, I mean, that, that I just was like, how can something vanish in the art history books? Mm -hmm. Any books that I re used to read as a lecturer, you know, like on photography, where's Joe Spence gone? Mm -hmm. You know, they're talking about all this intimate photography, but where's Joe Spence? Mm -hmm. And it was as if this whole thing was just cut out yeah. and moved. Anyway, sorry, that was my rant. But, <laughs> <laughs> but, but um, uh, Joe, did you have a? Yeah, sorry, I don't mind. I'm going to get into art and speak. Um, it's what I think is interesting about the London thing is Pamela Fox didn't get a London venue because we have that flashy mm -hmm. catalogue 
and the Arts Council and the GLC didn't like it. And they didn't like it because we had, we let, we actually insisted that every woman wrote something about her practice. Or, and there was one woman who dropped out of the show because she was at the RCA and they said, oh, you, you never write about it. Now, young women in our community seats have picked up that catalog in colleges and said, wow, you were involved with that, you know. Mm -hmm. And the, what, the, what was interesting about what Derek was saying about council, the GLC deprived us. We were supposed to have a festival for the baby. When they saw the council mm -hmm. and the arts council, they were a bit, oh, this is a bit flashy. Hang on, you're a bunch of women. Why have you got this glossy catalog? And they quite constructively, or destructively, kind of edged away from paying for the festival hall, which is what they were supposed to do. Then Jill Morgan and Rochdale, they took it on. Mm -hmm. And we had a good Northern tour, the arm of feeling took it on. And but we ended up at Chisholm Head. And that was our London venue, and we, we, that was the one that we all had to pay for. But I, I was the one that was going, I said, well, actually, you have to pay for this, sorry. You know. mm -hmm. but, it, 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 but we did it, we had it. But it was well after the, the main thrust of the show was here, RD, Hull, and, and the Northern Tour. So that, and I think London, was already a kind of a bit of a closed space, and, then, and even though the GLC was a Labour council, there are all sorts of shenanigans going on there. Which, for the youth work, it is. You know how long it is. I've got that much time. Well, what about well, to ask another question? It's a very it short is, one. It is three o'clock. If you're very quick. Well, Sarah, Sarah can give me a short answer. I was just, I was just interested because you, you talk about the fact that you'd studied at Leeds and you mentioned the Zelda. Um, and I've wondered how much connection the Zelda Park had with Rochdale Art Gallery at the time you were here. Because Griselda has, has been very supportive of, of us and what we're doing. I've heard her often in talks talk about Jill and the importance of what happened at Rochdale. Um, but she's never written about it, though she often talks about it in, in, in talks. And, and I just wondered, you know, I know, I know you studied with her, but how much, and she obviously had an influence as, as someone who is, who was <coughs> by Rosemary Matheson and was writing at the time, and, but I wondered, was there any direct connection between you, Jill, Beth, and, and Griselda in any way at the time? No. no. I've told you to <laughs> <much stories. laughs> It's... If you're talking about a physical connection of a person, no, yeah. you know. Yeah. But a lot of the people uh, would have had connections with Leeds yeah, yeah, and sure. the course. Yeah, of course. You know, so there was an influence in, in that way, but there wasn't really a, a you know, a kind of physical meeting with Griselda or Griselda coming to shows. Um, no, not really. Yeah. It's interesting, it sort of again goes back to this um, networks yeah. of influence mm -hmm. and the fact that you, you sort of started saying that... Um, Claire Slattery worked with Deborah Cherry on a Victorian yeah. painting that was exhibited here. And of course, Deborah had worked with Griselda and had written together. Yeah. And so there is a yeah. feminist network and the, and the impact and influence I think, of that. I think Griselda, may, I left in 91, and I think Griselda may have had... Been, I, I left here, yeah. yeah. I think Griselda may have had more of a... Physical. I mean, I don't know, but I I think that she may well have worked more closely after mm -hmm. in that period. But the, I mean, one of the reasons I ask the question is it's interesting that, that a lot of people I talk to make the assumption that Jill studied at Leeds. Yeah. 
difference with Griselda. Yeah. And no, I, mean, she didn't. I know you did, and I certainly know that she didn't, but, but lots of lots of people actually kind of mm. think that's the case yeah. because of a kind mm. of ideological connection. Perhaps. But you know what I think is really important is the last thing that you want or anyone wants to do about this period is to say that there were individual people yeah, okay absolutely. You, you know and it was something that was going on everywhere yeah. with lots of networks yeah. with lots of different women yeah. and one of the really important things about feminism is non that non-hierarchy yeah. and well, that's that the, would work you know if you get if people are gonna re-examine this period and and write a history of I just think it's really important that that's remembered, you know. And that, so when I hear people say, oh, well, Jill Morgan must have studied with Griselda, I kind of think, just because there's two women who have no, similar interests true. doesn't mean that they're, you know, <laughs> they must have known each other or worked together. Well, and I think it's, it's really true. important. It's really important to identify that that's what Jill would say. Well, in in yeah. my very inarticulate yeah. speech last night, I was trying to say that, Absolutely. That, that the first thing Jill said to me when I first talked to her about the idea of doing this show was, it's not about me, yeah. and don't make it about me. Mm -hmm. And she was very cross. We didn't design the, the leaflet thing, the gallery brochure. But she was very cross about the fact that Jill Morgan mm. appears in big letters mm. in that design. She said, why does my name look mm. like that? And, and, I, and, and I think, that's, again, that, that's... That, I think that, that's a personal yeah. observation that she made because of the kind of person she is, and it's also a political observation it's a political, that she made yeah. because that is the politics Absolutely. of the And I think that that's, that's really well. important, but I also think, let's have a little think about why do people want to do that? Mm. You know, why do they want to do that? <coughs> yeah, That's, absolutely. And I'm not yeah. answering that question, but you know, it, it's something to think about. Yeah. You know? yeah. We will continue thinking about that then. <laughs> thank you so much. Um, thank you so much, Sarah. Thank you so much, Leslie, oh, thank um, you. for an amazing conversation. I've definitely learned a lot and I've definitely got lots more to think about. Um, I really hope that you can join us all online on Wednesday for a, what's going to be a brilliant conversation between two photographers, um, Malcolm Glover, who was photographer in residence here in Rochdale in 1982, and Pogus Caesar, who's a magnificent um, uh, photographer, but they'll be talking about um, uh, different approaches to documentary photography online on Wednesday. And of course, we'll be having more uh, discussions like this one in the gallery in future weeks over the course of the exhibition. Um, but just my last uh, thing to do is again thank Sarah and Leslie. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.